Hey guys and welcome back or if you're new here hi welcome my name's Georgia and on my platforms here on the internet I focus mostly on true crime and history and this case today sits perfectly at the intersection of true crime, history and cults so much so that I'm kind of shocked that I haven't covered this one already. In late 1984, 751 people in the Dells in Oregon suddenly came down with symptoms of acute gastroenteritis. You're talking diarrhea, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, headaches, abdominal pain, bloody stools. And it was soon found to be caused by the salmonella bacteria. And salmonella is an illness you really, really do not want. The victims ranged in age from a newborn infant all the way up to an 87 year old and 45 people required hospital treatment. Considering the severity of this illness, it was truly fortunate that no one ended up dying. This was such a huge and random outbreak that the CDC were brought in to the Dells to investigate. And first they blamed the poor hygiene of the food handlers, but it was found that the victims had eaten at a number of different restaurants before coming down with the salmonella. It wasn't the same person in charge of preparing all this food. It was actually 10 restaurants to be exact, all of which happened to have salad bars. Now this is a county which typically reported fewer than five cases of salmonella a year, and now there's 751 in the space of just a few weeks. Although bioterrorism was considered to be a possibility when the outbreak was first being investigated by public health officials, it was considered to be highly, highly unlikely but not impossible, as they would soon discover. This would turn out to be the largest bioterror attack in US history, when it was eventually found that the actual culprits were members of the nearby Rajneeshpuram religious intentional community. But let's call a spade a spade, this was a cult. And why did they do it? Well, they wanted to depress voter numbers and secure two of the three available seats in the local November Wasco County elections. That was it. But let's go back to the very beginning where our story starts in India with a man who was born Chandra Mohan Jain in 1931. Although he would be called Rajneesh from childhood, a Sanskrit nickname loosely translating to God of Night. He was the oldest of 11 children and was sent to live with his maternal grandparents from a very early age where he was said to have this incredible amount of freedom from literally when he was a toddler, just allowed to come and go as he pleased. Until he had to move back in with his parents aged 8 after the death of his grandfather. Now the death of his grandfather and the later death of his girlfriend aged 15 would cause Rajneesh to become very critical of traditional religion. His parents were Jains, with Jainism being a non-theistic Indian religion and one of the oldest religions in the world. In very much a nutshell, Jainism teaches that the way to spiritual liberation and to bliss is to live a life of harmlessness and renunciation. They believe in reincarnation, with each new rebirth and life you gain more knowledge, leading you closer to moksha, which is this all-knowing state. Experiencing such death at such a young age led Rajneesh to question these teachings, and he was known to be a very intelligent, gifted student, but he had a knack for debate. He was argumentative. He was a voracious reader from a very young age, and he showed an interest in the writings of Marx and Engels, causing him to be brandished as a communist. However, he would later say that he identified more closely with anarchism, this idea of no state and no government. But even that interest of his was very flaky because he could never quite submit to any single social ideology, as you'll come to see. I mean, from a very young age, even back in India, he was a very controversial figure. Age 19, he began studying at Hikarini College in Jabalpur, but he was very argumentative and disruptive, so he was asked to leave, transferring to Dean Jane College instead. There, he was asked not to attend any of his classes except for his exams because, again, he was just too argumentative. With all this free time he now had as a student, he began working at a local newspaper and also began doing public speaking. He also said his spiritual enlightenment came around this time as well, on the 21st of March 1953, when he was 21 years old. He was sitting under a tree in a garden in Jabalpur, and suddenly he thought he had all the answers. He knew how to fix the world. By 1955, he'd completed his degree in philosophy and he joined the University of Sagar, where two years later he earned a master's also in philosophy. 
He secured a teaching position at the university soon after this, but he was considered to be a danger to the students' morality, character and religion. So once again, he was asked to leave. So instead, he transferred to Jabalpur University, where he was said to be a pretty popular lecturer. I mean, as cult leaders often were, he was a wildly charismatic and charming man. He was intelligent beyond most people's imaginations. People really liked him. Rajneesh remained at the university for quite a few years, alongside travelling the country and doing public speaking, giving critical lectures of socialism and institutional religions. Despite how controversial he was viewed to be, he soon did gain a loyal following, people who felt very disillusioned with traditional Indian religions and government. These people would pay for spiritual consultations from Rajneesh, and that's a business that soon became all-consuming for him, causing him to quit his job at the university. And instead, he started running meditation camps known as the Life Awakening Movement, focusing on the value of science and mysticism over religious dogma. Rajneesh also started to become known much more publicly around this time, and after publishing a series titled From Sex to Superconsciousness, in which he called for freer acceptance of sex, the press started to call him the sex guru. He believed that sex was theism and equated atheism with the belief that sexual acts are sinful. Sex is divine, he said, and obviously that is something that people want to hear. In early 1970, he presented his own type of meditation for the very first time. He called it dynamic meditation, which is where you basically breathe very fast alongside physical actions, dance and movement. And then he moved to Mumbai, where he got his first proper group of disciples, loyal followers. He said he rejected the idea of being worshipped, but he did say that he was simply the sun encouraging the flower to open. He was just the catalyst to this new lifestyle. Disciples would be made to take on new Hindi names and wear a traditional dress, and so around this time, Rajneesh also changed his name. His chosen name was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, Bhagwan being a Hindi word that translates to Lord in English. It basically represents the abstract concept of a universal god. So despite him saying he didn't wish to be worshipped, his chosen name didn't quite seem to align with that. And it did piss off quite a few of his followers, with Rajneesh saying that all of the wrong people started disappearing and the right people started to arrive. I am going to keep calling him just Rajneesh throughout this entire video because it's just easier that way and that was still his name, like people did still call him that. His main teaching at this time was to kind of live fully in the world but without any attachment to it and that would become a running theme throughout his entire, I don't want to say reign, throughout everything he did, throughout his entire life. He didn't last very long in Mumbai as he found the climate and the smog bad for his health and so instead he purchased property in Korogayon Park in Pune. Here he starts an ashram on six acres of land, and that's an ashram that still stands today and is widely visited by people all over the world. At this time, Rajneesh utilised audio and video recording, and he spread the word of his ashram worldwide, especially to the Western world. You know a Western person loves a little yoga retreat in Asia, and the ashram soon became hugely successful, with its own arts and crafts centre, its own theatre, and several therapists joining to also offer therapy groups. It's thought that he attracted Westerners with his embrace of materialism and sexual hedonism. Rajneesh referred to himself as the rich man's guru. At first, this very much seemed to be just your standard ashram, meditations and therapy talks by Rajneesh in both Hindi and English, English, but it didn't take long for controversies to pop up because quite a lot of it was, let's say, experimental. One group called the Encounter Group would allow physical aggression and sexual encounters between attendees, with reports of broken bones and rape from some people. The violence and apparently the rape ended by the 80s, but this was incredibly controversial. Whilst many, mostly tourists, would come and go from the ashram, there were also those who stayed long term. Once members had graduated after months of meditation, they could apply to work at the ashram, where Rajneesh had sort of carefully modelled the community based on an idea by the Russian philosopher and mystic Gurdjieff. Rajneesh handpicked certain aspects of Gurdjieff's work, such as unpaid labour and strict supervisors overseeing said hard work. This wasn't a really relaxing and meditative community, it was really tough, but despite that, many disciples hung around for years. 
I do want to say at this point though that no one was ever forced to stay at the ashram. People were free to leave as they wished and soon the rapid growth of the community outgrew this ashram in Pune. Disciples did start looking for other properties across India but it was really hard to find approved land thanks to tensions between the ashram, local political parties and religious leaders. A lot of people obviously didn't agree with Rajneesh and his very controversial views. By 1981 the ashram hosted 30,000 visitors per year, most of whom were European and American and Rajneesh's teachings changed to reflect that or at least he changed his way of speaking. He switched to dirty jokes and laughter rather than his very strong anti-religious message and that did rub some people up the wrong way, especially people who had been with him for years. The ashram was also under the microscope of the Indian government who had cancelled their tax exempt status and had made a $5 million claim against them. And as I'm saying that aloud, I'm realising, I assume that $5 million is converted into American dollars from what it was in Indian, what is Indian currency? Indian rupee, of course, the rupee. Around this time, Rajneesh decides to replace his secretary with a job now going to Ma Anand Sheila, who was born as Sheila Patel. She was an Indian Swiss woman who had moved to the US aged 18 for college. Now with these sort of increased tensions around the ashram, the money they owed, the fear of repercussions from local people, religious leaders, political leaders, they knew their time in Pune was quickly running out. So Sheila has an idea, why don't they move their entire community over to the USA? I mean, most of their visitors were American anyway, she knew the culture, it kind of just made sense and there was a lot of open land in the USA. So in 1981, Rajneesh travelled to the USA on a tourist visa where he is also said to have received extensive medical treatment for a prolapse disc in his back. He was generally a very ill man, he had diabetes, asthma, numerous allergies and now he also had these back problems. This medical situation would later create a load of problems for him with the US government and immigration service, eventually pleading guilty to immigration fraud. He sort of lied on his visa about why he was going over to the country. They said he made false statements on his visa application about his intention to remain in the USA because after this point, after receiving the medical treatment, he wouldn't go back home to India. In June 1981, Sheila's husband, John Shelfer, signed a contract to purchase property in Oregon for $5.75 million. It was a 64,000 acre ranch located across both Wasco and Jefferson counties. I can't even begin to explain to you the sheer size and extent of this ranch, which has previously been named the Big Muddy Ranch. I think they had sheep on it. This was so much land and just for a bit of context I looked at how big the island of Manhattan is and that's only 14,600 acres. So the land they bought in Oregon was so much larger than Manhattan. And the fact they just purchased it for just under six million dollars shows you just how much money the ashram in India had been raking in. That's equivalent to almost 20 million dollars today. They had big plans with this land, they wanted to quite literally create their own city. They wanted an airstrip, restaurants and a fire department and within three years they were able to build all of this and more. In 1982 they successfully petitioned to become a city in their own right. This was a utopia for Rajneesh and his disciples with almost 7,000 followers immediately moving from India to the ranch. This was supposed to be a free love new age utopia in nature, blending eastern and western spirituality, a place for people to meet. And you can definitely see the appeal for some people, like it would end up attracting thousands of visitors over the years, generating unimaginable amounts of money in just pure income. Rajneesh was a sex guru, the guru of the rich, you're going to follow him and understand how to truly unlock sexual pleasure, you're going to learn how to make money, how to combine these aspects of your life. I mean, you can imagine that this particularly drew in a younger audience, especially coming off of the back of the free love movement that was huge throughout the 60s and the 70s. And now there's this beautiful community that's popped up in the middle of nowhere that promotes all of that and more. You've got to wonder how Rajneesh was able to amass such a following, like how he was able to convince so many people to leave their families, their homes, their countries and come join him on a ranch in middle of nowhere, Oregon. But things like this don't happen in a vacuum. You've got people feeling disillusioned by traditional religion, but also not ready to entirely give up on the idea. 
often people who have grown up very religious will still look for something to believe in, for something to follow. I mean, at the end of the day, cults and religions are both organised belief systems. His emphasis on free love, on having control over your sexuality, on human pleasure, really, really cool to people, and you can understand why. Cult leaders like Rajneesh don't really control people in the physical sense. I mean, a lot of cult leaders don't outright ban people from coming and going as they please. It's much more of a mental, a psychological control. These people have the ability to truly understand what makes a person tick, and they have the ability to get inside their heads. In a setting such as Rajneesh Puram, which is what the city in Oregon would come to be known, or even the ashram back in India with the meditation, the therapy, the focus on spirituality, it's easy to understand how he might be able to get in one's head. Of course, not everyone is a good candidate to join a cult. Not everyone's going to be susceptible to someone like Rajneesh. I mean, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that it could not be me. I'm too distrustful of people. I'm not a spiritual or religious person in the slightest. I question everything thing a million times over. But I know plenty of people in my real life who would be, and that's not a negative thing. These are people who see the best in everyone, who are happy to go with the crowd. Sometimes people are just looking for community, for family, for like-minded individuals. Or it can even be more subtle than that. A friend saying, hey, we've got this fun thing to do on a Monday night, you should come along. And you go, you meet people, they're charming, bam, you're in a cult. It's easy to judge people who become cult members, it's easy to like wonder how on earth you find yourself in that position, but it's a lot more complicated than that, it's a very slow process a lot of the time, and these people, they're just looking for community. Despite this cult in particular having the facade of rejecting tradition, according to numerous articles and investigations, it does appear that the leaders kept very tight control. This was kept as an isolated community by design. There's a reason they went to middle of nowhere, Oregon. According to The Verge, the commune would extract donations from the members who gave everything they had. They'd reportedly call their parents and ask for donations upwards of $20,000. They're not just running on the profits from the ashram, they're running on the money of the members. Everyone on the Oregon Commune, which came to be known as Rajneesh Puram, wore shades of red, although they were known locally as the Orange People. They worked on the communal farms, they helped build the community from the ground up. But as you might be able to imagine, this brand new massive community suddenly popping up caused some very mixed feelings with the locals. The closest town to Rajneesh Puram was a small retirement community called Antelope, the 1980 census showing a population of just 39 people. Incorporated in just 1901, Antelope was originally on the stagecoach route headed to the gold mines in Canyon City. It briefly boomed to just a few hundred people in the early 1900s, and then as times changed, people left, causing it to become a very small but very close-knit community. And then one day, 7,000 people descended upon this very small and desolate place. Some Antelope residents stood their ground and refused to move from their homes, the only homes they'd ever known, whilst others sold their lots and left as the Rajneeshis attempted to buy more and more of the lots in town. A lot of people felt very forced out, this so-called utopia for some being the end of life as they knew it for others. So from early on, tensions were pretty high between Antelope and the Rajneeshis, with lots of conflict over use of land and legal battles, although some locals did make attempts to try and sort of reach out, come to agreements, but the leaders of Rajneesh Puram had very little patience for the locals. There were no allowances made for the fact that their homes had essentially been taken over overnight, and just overall they did not deal with it in a good way at all. They almost immediately resorted to threats and confrontation. Intimidation was definitely their tactic of choice here. The leaders would say they do one thing, then they do another, and they just constantly undermine the local residents. As I said, in 1982, Rajneesh Puram officially becomes a city and the locals just got even angrier, and soon the anger and upset spills onto other surrounding communities as well. What the Rajneeshis had done wasn't technically illegal, they had legally purchased this ranch, it was theirs with which they could do as they wished, but the way they'd forced themselves into the community was really upsetting for lots of people. State Attorney General Dave Fronemeyer actually filed a suit against the city, claiming that it violated the First Amendment separation of church and state clause. At the end of the day, this was a religious integrated community, directly controlled by a religious leader. It wasn't separation of church and state. 
it. With the tensions high, the Rajneeshi set up a peace force, which was basically people walking around the commune carrying guns and driving into town in a jeep with a 30 caliber machine gun mounted on the top. As you can imagine, fights began to break out and then a local hunting magazine called for open season on the Rajneesh, who called them the Red Rats or the Red Vermin. But despite the pushback, they just continued to expand, buying more lots from the locals. By February 1983, they won control of the nearby Antelope City Council. And of course they did, because there were 7,000 of them, and they changed the name of the town from Antelope to Rajneesh. With the new power, they also raised property taxes with the intention of driving any remaining residents out. They wanted to completely take over. Coalitions of Oregon residents did do all they could to try and bring down the city. The group 1000 Friends of Oregon spent six years prosecuting to try and void the incorporation to get the buildings they'd put up removed. They wanted the entire city dismantled, the alien cult as they called it, just gone. But once again, the Rajneeshis weren't technically doing anything illegal. They were well within their rights to buy the ranch and build on it. But permits were constantly denied for the buildings, which did slow down their progress. They were literally trying to build an entire city on this ranch, and I don't know why I'm saying trying, because they did do it. There were theatres, there was housing, there were shops, there was a transport system, there was a sewage system. Like, literally, they built an entire city on this ranch in a record amount of time. It was so, so quick. Oregon legislature did end up passing several bills that sought to slow down or stop the development entirely, but they didn't really care. Like, the Rajneeshis didn't care what bills were being bought in. They were still going to build their city. It was just the way they bulldozed into the community and took over that really rubbed people up the wrong way, along with their very strange way of life. I mean, every day Rajneesh would do a drive-by in which all the disciples would line up alongside of the road and greet him, literally thousands of them. Probably worth noting that as the city grew, we actually don't know exactly how many people ended up living there. We know it was around 7,000 to start, but it's often thought they would hide people and even hide beds when officials came in to check population numbers. So we don't really know. Some numbers do say as high as 15,000 people. The disciples, the Rajneeshis as they were called, would be out on the grounds working in either the blazing heat or the freezing cold, being worked to the bone by strict supervisors. And then there was Rajneesh himself, with his very ostentatious displays of wealth in this formerly quite poor retirement community. It's said that he wore jeweled watches worth millions of dollars and he owned a fleet of 93 Rolls Royces. Other sources state even higher numbers that he maybe had a different Rolls Royce for every single day of the year. You've got to wonder why people were so eager to continue to follow him, but that's cult life for you. And Rajneesh never made a secret of the fact that he valued wealth money. People thought that by following him, they would also get that rich. As time went on, more and more issues arose within the commune. According to a Bustle article, the cult claimed to maintain this free love, but children were a big no-no. According to an ex-commune member, if a woman got pregnant, both at the ashram in India or at the commune in Oregon, she was forced to make a very stark choice, either agree to have an abortion or leave the property immediately. There were zero children born in Oregon to Rajneesh cult members. His top women officials were mandatorily sterilised, with sterilisation encouraged for any woman who joined them. And I do note that the women were the ones encouraged to be sterilised, which is a much more complex and irreversible procedure than the male alternative. According to an article in The Conversation, which I am going to read verbatim for you, 54% of Rajneesh's devotees were women. Many had abandoned relationships, successful careers, and occasionally young children in order to create a utopia around their spiritual leader. Every woman that I interviewed at length had been influenced by the feminist movement of the 1970s and hoped for full economic, sexual and social equality. They wanted to live very differently from their housewife mothers, however they were deeply disappointed when they still felt anxious and lonely despite the money and recognition they received from their careers. They told me they felt forced to choose between successful careers and fulfilling marriages. They lost with either choice. But Rajneesh asserted that women could succeed in every endeavour as well as or better than men. He applauded high levels of achievement and also emphasised the importance of traditionally feminine traits like intuition and emotional sensitivity for both women and men. He told women they could and should integrate their personal and professional lives. He said, It is for the betterment of both man and woman that the woman should be given every freedom and equal opportunity for her individuality. So yeah, I suppose you could argue that this was more of a feminist cult than other cults of the time may 
have been, but there were definitely still strands of misogyny running through it. Women were the ones who had to be sterilized. Rajneesh is saying that women should be able to bring in every aspect of their lives to the cult, but they can't bring in motherhood, which is a big part of the human, the female condition. Not for everyone, of course, may I add, but many women were encouraged to abandon their children back at home to come and join the cult. Despite this, the Rajneeshis were willing to fight for their city, for their way of life. They believed in it. They knew that if they wanted to keep things moving at Rajneesh Puram, they needed full control of the local Wasco County government, and they were willing to do whatever they needed to do to get that. Whilst Rajneesh Puram was so large and enveloped Antelope and other small communities, in the wider picture of Wasco County, they only really made up about 10% of the population. Oregon law said at the time, and I don't know if it's still the same today, that anyone living in an area for 20 days or more with intentions to stay longer can register to vote. And so the Rajneeshis decided to use this to their advantage, wanting to strengthen their voting bloc. In late summer 1984, the Rajneeshis began what they called the Share a Home Initiative, where over 3,000 unhoused people from across the United States were bussed into Rajneesh Puram, hundreds at a time to just live there. To outsiders and to the people being bussed in, this seemed like an apparent act of goodwill, with a commune spokesperson claiming that the purpose was simply to share with some people who have been less fortunate than what we have. A Washington Post article by Michael Marriott from September 1984 reads, about 60 homeless men from Washington's missions, shelters, steam grates and park benches have been bussed to the countryside of central Oregon in recent weeks, free of charge, to live and work in a commune founded by the controversial Indian mystic Bhagwan Shri Rajneesh. Followers of Rajneesh say the effort is part of a massive new charity aimed at giving some society's least fortunate persons another chance. A spokesperson saying that we're inviting people to participate in community in which people enjoy life and live a constructive, beautiful lifestyle. There are no drugs, no violence, people must simply obey the laws of the community and not have any pending trouble with the law. The article features an interview with John Ratchford, who was living in a shelter in Washington, and he was one of 30 men who arrived at Rajneesh Puram just three days beforehand. He said in a telephone interview that he wasn't worried about motives now that he lives in the best place in the world. Quote, on Sunday, I was in Lafayette Park when a railways bus pulled up. The people talk so nice, I decided to check it out. I jumped on it. He said that no one required him to work at the commune, but he volunteered to do what he could and the food and the shelter was entirely free. However, despite the argument of the Rajneeshi, every person who was brought into Rajneesh Purim was expected to register to vote and vote the party ticket when it came to the 1984 elections. But what they hadn't quite planned for was the fact that many of these unhoused people that they'd brought in suffered with untreated mental illness, and it wasn't long until fights broke out within the commune that life was disrupted. I mean, what did they think was going to happen bringing in such a huge number of outsiders who didn't know the commune's way of life? Of course things were going to be disrupted. So what did the Rajneeshis do? They assumed control by injecting a tranquilizer called Haldol into the beer kegs that were used to serve the guests. They drugged them. It didn't take long for the Rajneeshis to realise that their plan to get these people to vote was very flawed, because whilst Oregon law did allow people to vote after living there for just 20 days, the Wasco County clerk enforced a regulation that required all new voters to submit their qualifications to vote, essentially blocking the plan. So the Rajneeshis just got all the unhoused people back on the buses and dropped them back in the streets in various parts of Oregon. That plan was over. So the idea to boost their own numbers for votes hadn't worked, so they decided to try something completely different instead. They decided to incapacitate other people in the Dalles so they couldn't vote. Now it's important to note that by this point, Rajneesh himself had been in a period of public silence for about, I think, a year and a half, and in this time, Ma and Nan Sheila had been the one doing most of the talking on his behalf, after he'd fully coached her in how to use media coverage and words to her advantage. But people had joined the commune and Rajneeshism for Rajneesh, not for Sheila, and a lot of people had problems with her leadership. 
In October 1984, he ended his period of silence and announced it was time for him to speak his truths, stating that he will not leave his people under a fascist regime, which was a pretty direct attack on Sheila. She'd served underneath him for years and was quickly turned against once discomfort grew within the commune. It was smart and probably calculated that this is the point that he decided to start talking again, to point a finger of blame at Sheila for anything going wrong and able to avoid any blame himself. The commune leadership, namely Sheila and Martinan Puja, planned to make people in the dull sick, which is where most voters resided, in order to sway the upcoming election. About 12 people were involved in the actual plot here, and at least 11 were involved in the planning process. They purchased salmonella bacteria from a medical supply company in Seattle, Washington, and they sent it to the Rajneesh Purim labs to be cultured, because yes, they even had their own labs in the city. There, it seems like no more than four people were directly involved in developing this bacteria for use, although not all of these people were necessarily aware of what was going to be done with it. Over the summer of 1984, a number of trial runs were carried out by the commune to test the effectiveness of this salmonella bacteria, with the idea that if these trials were successful, similar techniques could be used close to the November election. Two visiting Wasco County commissioners were infected via glasses of water containing salmonella during a visit to Rajneesh Purim on August 29, 1984. Both of these officials fell ill and one was hospitalised. Then, members of Sheila's team spread the bacteria on produce at local grocery stores and on doorknobs and urinal handles in the county courthouse. In September and October, they took up a notch when they contaminated the salad bars of 10 local restaurants, with the salmonella suspended in a light brown liquid in plastic bags. The perpetrators referred to it as their salsa. When no one was watching, they poured the liquid over the open salad and mixed it into the salad dressings. By September 24th, more than 150 people had fallen violently ill, and by the end of September, 751 cases had been recorded. I do just want to take a moment here to specifically talk about salmonella poisoning, which is truly an awful thing. I've had it before thanks to a badly cooked burger from Top Golf in Las Vegas, so thank you to them. And let me tell you, it is truly horrendous, and also just saying not something you want to have when you have an 11 hour flight home. You don't. Salmonella infection is one of the most common types of food poisoning and is usually caused by eating raw or undercooked meat, poultry, egg products, or by drinking unpasteurized milk. Even your fruit and veg aren't safe. Salad leaves are particularly susceptible to salmonella and E. coli. If you open a bag of spinach and it has an odd smell, or if you've got like dark soggy bits of leaves at the bottom of the bag, steer clear, don't eat it, just don't. The incubation period of salmonella is anywhere from six hours to six days, and then the symptoms can last up to 10 days, although it can sometimes take months for your bowels to fully go back to normal. Signs and symptoms include diarrhea, stomach cramps, fever, nausea, vomiting, chills, headaches, blood in your stool, and much more. And whilst it does generally pass without needing any like proper medical attention, that's not always the case, especially in more vulnerable populations. The elderly, the young, or the already ill are at risk of severe dehydration and further complications. Salmonella isn't going to kill every person it comes into contact with, but it can definitely be deadly in the wrong person. So the Rajneeshis are really lucky that no one died. On September 17th, 1984, a disease control expert for the Wasco Sherman Public Health Department began to receive reports of recent cases of gastroenteritis in persons who had eaten meals in either of two local restaurants in the Dalles several days before these symptoms started. They collected stool samples from the recently ill persons and sent them to the state public health lab to be cultured. And by the end of the week, the samples confirmed that 15 people were positive for the bacterium Salmonella typhimurium. This early on, they did make the connection to salad bars, noting that multiple of the victims had eaten at salad bars in the community before becoming ill. About a week later, on 24th September, the disease control experts learned of additional cases, and that some had even been hospitalised. As a result, they contacted the Oregon Health Division and then the CDC for assistance, and then the salad bars were closed. Not the entire restaurants, just the salad bars, but still companies lost thousands of dollars in profit. The attack caused hysteria and worry among the local populations, who for the most part just stopped going out to eat at all because nobody wants gastroenteritis. 
Towards the end of September, two medical epidemiologists from the CDC arrived in the Dalles to provide assistance, and over the next six weeks, a public health team continued an extensive investigation. They collected additional samples, they interviewed people, they studied the area. Seeing as the outbreak was so large, investigators were sure they'd quickly be able to find a common pattern or thread that could explain the occurrence of illness in so many people. But despite their efforts, they couldn't identify a single food item or contamination of a single food item that could have accounted for such an outbreak. Remember they'd already made the connection back to salad bars, but this was multiple different salad bars, so they were trying to find out what ingredient was coming from the same place in all these different salad bars. Now, multiple residents of the Dalles had contacted investigators to express concerns about possible suspicious behaviours of some local commune members. And whilst they did think about the fact this could be a possible bioterror attack, and it did raise questions about intentional contamination, this theory was kind of just brushed past. Bioterrorism is defined as the use of infectious agents or other harmful biological or biochemical substances as weapons of terrorism, whilst terrorism is the unlawful use of violence in the pursuit of political aims. So yeah, that is exactly what this was from the Rajneeshis, a bioterrorism attack for the purpose of votes. But nobody else knew that yet. In 1999, the CDC actually published a journal called Emerging Infectious Diseases, which described six motivational factors often associated with terrorism. These are charismatic leadership, no outside constituency, apocalyptic ideology, loner or splinter group, sense of paranoia and grandiosity, and defensive aggression. According to this, the Rajneeshi satisfied all motivational factors aside from the apocalyptic ideology. So their plan was always to make people ill so they were too ill to go and vote. But of course, the Rajneeshi's plan backfired as the local residents all assumed that they were the ones responsible. And so they all made sure to head to the polls on election day to prevent them from winning any county positions. And so the plot was unsuccessful. Even without this, however, it is highly unlikely they would have ever won because only 239 of the Rajneesh Purim residents ended up being able to vote as the vast majority weren't US citizens and therefore not eligible. So in November 1984, they withdrew all candidates, which is just crazy. Now, the CDC at the time ended up putting the breakout down to the poor personal hygiene of food handlers, even though this did seem wildly unlikely to cause so much illness. Chapman Way, who was one of the creators of the Wild Wild County documentary on Netflix, which looks at the Rajneeshi, said, I think there was a huge rush to judgment by the CDC to blame food handlers for the salmonella outbreak. I think once the number of victims had reached over 500 people, there was a tremendous amount of pressure on the CDC to claim a cause for the outbreak and put everyone at ease. It didn't seem like calling this a terrorist attack would calm citizens down. Food handling seemed like a much tamer cause. However, Oregon Democratic Congressman James H. Weaver was unsatisfied with this, and he urged the CDC to continue with their investigation. His concern was seen by a lot of people as just being Rajneeshi bashing, but he went on to give a speech at the US House of Representatives on the 28th of February 1985, where once again he accused them, and again, he was accused of just bashing them, but it turns out he was right. Time, as it does, moved on, and one whole year after the attacks in September 1985, Rajneesh himself spoke up about the allegations, essentially throwing Sheila under the bus, claiming they had tried to commit similar crimes against him. He said that Sheila and her companions had tried to poison his doctor and a female companion, as well as trying to poison the Jefferson County District Attorney. At this point, Rajneesh claimed that he'd never given Sheila any instructions to do any of this, something that she actually herself would later back up. This, like I said, is now a year after the attacks. The investigation into the Rajneesh's involvement had basically come to an end. Nothing could be proven, nothing could be done. And now, here's Rajneesh, or Osho as he was starting to be known, but we'll continue to call him Rajneesh, basically admitting that his commune were responsible. Following this, a massive task force was established by the Oregon Attorney General David B. Fronemeyer, with members from the Wasco County Sheriff's Office, the Oregon State Police, the FBI, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, as well as the National Guard. They set up their headquarters within Rajneesh Purim to begin their investigation, with 50 investigators entering the ranch on 2nd of October 1985. 
Of course, they found what they were looking for almost immediately when they walked into the lab and came across glass vials containing Salmonella bactrol discs, which were confirmed to match exactly the bacteria eaten by the people who got sick. It was the same. But that wasn't all they found. They also found experimentations with poison, chemicals and bacteria carried out between 1984 and 1985. There was a copy of the Anarchist Cookbook as well as other literature on the manufacture and use of explosives and military biowarfare, alongside books with titles including Deadly Substances, Handbook for Poisoning, The Perfect Crime and How to Commit It, and Let Me Die Before I Wake. And if that's not enough, there are also numerous texts about assassinations, explosives and terrorism. This lab was described as a biological freezer dryer for large scale production of microbes. Not only was it crystal clear that they'd been responsible for the 1984 attacks, but they also had the means to do much, much worse if they wanted. Alongside this, investigators concluded that the commune had more than likely carried out other attacks than the ones in the Dalles, including in Salem, Portland and other Oregonian cities. According to testimony later heard in court, the commune even boasted about an attack in a nursing home and on a salad bar in the Mid-Columbia Medical Centre, which was a hospital. But again, this wasn't proven in court. And the cherry on top of the cake? They also discovered an aborted plot to murder former United States Attorney for Oregon, Charles Turner. An order was found dated the 25th of September 1984 for Salmonella typhi, a different Salmonella bacterium that caused typhoid fever, a life-threatening illness. With investigators quickly closing in, Rajneesh left Oregon by plane on October 27, 1985, but he was quickly arrested in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he was charged with 35 counts of deliberate violation of immigration laws, so nothing to do with the attacks. He pled guilty to two counts of making false statements to immigration officials and received a 10-year suspended sentence as part of a plea deal and a fine of $400,000. By this point, Ma Anand Sheila and Ma Anand Pooja had escaped to West Germany, which is where they were arrested on the 28th of October, and they were extradited back to Portland a few months later. Interviews with commune members quickly placed blame on Sheila as the mastermind behind everything, and a trial soon started. In court, the mayor of Rajneesh Puram, who was David Berry Knapp or Swami Krishna Devi, turned for the state, aka he admitted guilt and agreed to testify as a witness of the state in exchange for leniency. In his testimony, he accused Sheila of playing doubters tapes of Rajneesh's voice, in which he's saying that if it's necessary to do things to preserve his vision, then they should just do it, and they shouldn't worry if some people had to die as a result. He also claimed that Sheila had spoken to Rajneesh about her plot, to which he replied it was best not to hurt people but if a few people died, don't worry, evidence that he knew about it all along. Lots of commune members back this up, including Sheila's husband, John Shelfer. In 2020, he said, Sheila was very good at framing the issues in a way that would invite Osho's approval of whatever she wanted to do. She might ask a general broad question, get an answer, and then she would go back and use that as Osho authorising whatever it was she wanted to do. She would provide and limit information as it would help support what she wanted. On the 22nd of July 1986, both women entered Orford pleas for the Salmonella attacks, which is basically a guilty plea in which a defendant in a criminal case doesn't admit to an act, but acknowledges that the evidence is likely going to be able to persuade a judge or a jury to find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So, in the end, both Sheila and Pooja were charged with attempting to murder Rajneesh's personal physician, first degree assault for poisoning Judge William Hulse, second degree assault for poisoning the Dells Commissioner Raymond Matthews, product tampering for the poisonings in the Dells, and wiretapping and immigration offences. I suppose I should mention here that as well as the lab, they also found a massive wiretapping operation in Rajneesh Puram as well, said to be one of the largest ever found in the USA, and in the end, 21 commune members would be indicted for this. Sheila ended up receiving 20 years for the attempted murder of the physician, 20 years for the assault against Judge Hulse, 10 years for second degree assault, four and a half years for the wiretapping conspiracy and five years probation for immigration fraud, all to be served concurrently, so at the same time. Pooja received 15 years for the attempted murder, 15 years for the first degree assault, seven and a half years for the second degree assault, four and a half years for the Salmonella attacks, as well as three years probation for the wiretapping conspiracy. Again, all to be served concurrently. However, both women would be released on parole for good behaviour after serving just 29 months in a minimum security prison. 
I know no one died, but still, it just doesn't seem like enough, does it? Like, they just got lucky. People could have died. Sheila's green card was revoked upon her release and she went back to Switzerland where she went on to get remarried. State Attorney General David Frohmeyer commented, the Rajneeshis committed the most significant crimes of their kind in the history of the United States. The largest single incident of fraudulent marriages, the most massive scheme of wiretapping and bugging, and the largest mass poisoning. It was so massive that the entire incident was actually kept out of the Journal of the American Medical Association until 1997, due to fears that it would inspire copycats. But there's no other such group ever known to have successfully cultured a pathogen like this. With Rajneesh out of the country, back his ashram in Pune, you would think the commune would come to an end, but it actually didn't. Rajneesh Puram continued on for quite a few years without their leader until the commune moved on in 1990. And then in 2005, the Oregon State Land Board sold 480 acres to a Colorado-based youth ministry called Young Life. So it just went from one organised belief system to another. It is now known as Washington Family Ranch, hosting thousands of teenagers every summer for evangelical readings and fun. Upon his return to India, Rajneesh preached of the horrors of America, saying it must either be hushed up or be the end of the world. He was given a hero's welcome back in his country and continued to travel the world, occasionally coming up against more visa issues. His talks continued, he officially took on the name Osho full time, and then on the 19th of January 1990, age 58, he died at the ashram in Pune, the official cause of his death being heart failure. However, his disciples released a statement stating he died because living in the body had become a hell after he was allegedly poisoned in US jails, but there is no proof of that. You would think with his death, Rajneeshism would be a thing of the past, but he still has followers, people who believe in his teachings. But I suppose people are allowed to believe what they want as long as they're causing no harm to others. Hopefully there'll be no more bioterror attacks. This was the largest act of bioterrorism in American history. To this day, it still is. Even the anthrax attacks of the early noughties still weren't as big as this. 751 people got ill from this. Thankfully, no one died. And once the CDC came to town and started to investigate, it seems like the poisoning stopped. But there is evidence, as found in Rajneesh Purim, to maybe suggest that this was just their dry run. They had plans to poison the entire area's water supply. And thank God that never happened. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Hopefully you've learned something that you didn't know anything about beforehand. I can't believe, as I said at the beginning of this episode, that I had never heard of this before and that I hadn't covered it up until this point. It was a really, really interesting one to research and get stuck into. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.